and Prof. Dr. Daniel Plews is just one part of the Plews and Prof, a company who specializes in maximizing performance, health, and longevity in athletes. For seven years, Dan worked with High Performance Sport New Zealand, where he has been immersed in the rowing program. During this time, he attended both the London and Rio Olympic Games, where the rowing team claimed five gold, one silver, and two bronze. Academically, Dan is a research fellow at AUT University in New Zealand. He has 17 peer-reviewed publications in various academic journals, and his PhD focused on heart rate variability. Nine of these publications in the practical application of heart rate variability to assist in informing training decisions. Dan's also a top coach to professional triathletes such as Tim and Jan van Berkel and Carolyn Stefan. He still competes competitively himself in Ironman Triathlon, winning the age group competition overall in 2017 at Ironman New Zealand in an amazing time of 8 hours and 54 minutes. Prof. Paul Larson is a physiologist and coach. Across the last two Olympic cycles, Dr. Larson was employed as lead physiologist for High Performance Sport New Zealand alongside a joint position as the adjunct professor of exercise physiology at the Auckland University of Technology. This unique role positioned him at the nexus between theory, research, and application of sports science and physiology for Olympic sports in New Zealand. While he continues his professorial role, he is now based in Canada as a coach and consultant. He's amounted more than 125 scientific publications, holds two international patents, and is the inventor of the world's first ice slushy bottle. Check it out at flowbottle.com. He's personally competed in 17 Ironman triathlon events, including Hawaii, with a personal best time of 9.57. Gentlemen, thanks so much for taking the time out today. Hey, thanks for having us, Mark. No problem. Well, listen, can we kick things off with giving uh, listeners a little bit of a background of how you both got into the endurance sports side of things? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Yeah, I'll I'll kick things off. Um, I uh, became interested in sports science and sport through my love of endurance sport. I used to follow my dad around when he was trying to quit smoking, running marathons and that, uh, through my childhood. Um, and that slowly, I guess, got me more and more interested into this new sport that was becoming popular at the time called triathlon. I got heavy into triathlon and, uh, there was talk that it was going to be an Olympic sport in the future. I, I, uh, had a go at trying to, um, become i guess uh you know the canada's version of simon whitfield but that i could see that wasn't happening for me so i (laughs) as we all know what it wasn't close at all but uh that was that was the goal and i when i finally realized that wasn't going to happen i quickly transitioned into uh into sports science research um at uh at ubc where um where you tell me that uh that you went to as well mark yes Um, x thunderbird there you go. Nice. Same. So, um, well, kind of, um, anyways, I, uh, I did, re- I, my master's, uh, up to my master's level at, at UBC and then got a scholarship to go over to Australia, uh, to do my PhD. And, uh, Australia was kicking goals at the time in terms of this in the, in the sports science field. And I did my PhD there, got to do some work with the Australian Institute of Sport uh, became a professor over there and then got recruited to be, to lead physiology at, um, at, at high performance sport, New Zealand in their Olympic program. And along the, somewhere between Australia and New Zealand, I met up with this guy by the name of Dr. Daniel Plews. And, uh, we kind of, we hit it off, uh, with respect to our interests and, uh, yeah, and that's where Plues and Prof event Plues and Prof eventually, I guess, took uh, took place and and and, and formed. And uh, maybe I'll let the Plues take over from there. Yeah, well, I guess um, yeah, I guess my story is very similar, to, very similar to Prof's. And my dad was also a real endurance junkie. He he did um, he did competitive cycling when he was younger, and then he he took up triathlon. So I actually my starting of doing endurance sport was from a very early age i actually did my first swim run event when i was just um nine years old so like it's actually been in my blood for a very long time and i guess that's what um inspired me to to take this the interest that i have currently and have had for a number of years um and when i was in the i was um waiting for the british team i was on lottery funding and i um Winning the national junior and some some pretty big, some reasonably big races as a as a junior and a, and a youngster, 
Um, but I kind of went to a Loughborough University, which is a major sports science university, and was really quite a terrible student, to be honest <laughs> with you. <laughs> but I, uh, because I too I much was training, so obsessed with training, um, <laughs> and just spent all my time um, trying to train and being too tired to go to lectures. But after I finished my under my degree, my undergrad at least, um, I kind of realised, okay, a bit like Prof. I was, I'm going to say I was a bit closer than Prof was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I no, realized no that question. my attention probably wasn't where it needed to be, and I kind of refocused my attention to doing a master's, and I did my master's um, on a scholarship with British, the British Triathlon Federation, where I was actually um, coaching at the same time. Um, Mr. Brownlee and Johnny Brownlee, who are now you know, the Olympic, Olympic gold and silver medalists from Rio were, were there as juniors. Um, so that was pretty cool, and I... Finished my master's, went from there over to Singapore, um, did some travel and coaching, but quickly moved from more into into the sports science for the Singapore Sports Council. Um, basically, being involved in endurance sports, I built um, a cycling team there, which was the OCBC Singapore cycling team, and they actually went on to be in the Tour of Langkawi and hold the white jersey for a while. So they actually got reasonably good. But in Singapore, I actually met the prof. Um, and then, so we hit it off really quick. Like Prof said, we had so many, so many similar interests, and I've read a lot of the Prof's working. He he still laughs to this day. He think he thinks I was a bit starstruck when I first met him, but I wasn't. <laughs> <Are you? laughs> really. <laughs> um, yeah, and then and then yeah, then Prof brought me over to New Zealand um, to do the PhD in HRV, um, which I which I which I did, but. Um, Shortly into getting over there, I quickly picked up the position with rowing, the rowing program, working as a, um, the main physiologist in, for Rowing New Zealand. And so I did a PhD and um, worked at rowing full time for, for four years, which was very hard work, but um, short term pain, long term gain, as they say. And I finished a PhD and yeah, I continued to work. And, and after Rio, I kind of just um, moved, moved away from um, rowing. I'm still doing a little bit of work with high performance sport. In um, in kayak, um, and also doing some of my own stuff, which is um, the blues and prof and various other things, keep me busy. Fantastic, guys. Well, uh, we'll look forward to just kind of jumping right in here and some of the fantastic work that you guys have done. And of course, for myself here in Toronto, working with uh, you know elite athletes, but also weekend warriors, and this idea of you know we assume that athletes who are very lean are obviously the healthiest group, um, and that you know this idea of visceral body fat or the white adipose that sort of quote unquote the bad fat is not an issue for them um can you talk about some of the things that you found in certain athletes and the difference between you know visceral and subcutaneous fat yeah don't mean yeah to go, well, well maybe i'll just i'll just start by just saying um so i've done some uh some uh, along my journey in the in the area of uh i guess you know the iron man triathlon when i was back idolizing the iron man triathlon guys there was this guy by the name of Phil Maftone, uh, who was the coach uh, of Mark Allen. Um, and he had all these, I guess, innovative or uh, different kind of theories in terms of how you should train and what you should eat. And it was back in the late 80s and early 90s. And it was, you know, it was claimed to be responsible for some of Mark Allen's success and world record performances uh, in the Ironman at that time. And he kind of disappeared uh, for a while. We'd never really heard too much about him. But when I wrote a paper um, with the Plues on, um, I guess, showing the importance of fat oxidation for high-intensity exercise performance, he actually gave me, he gave me um, uh, an email. And I was just blown away when, you know, when he kind of out of the blue emailed me. And we've, uh, I guess, formed a good relationship since. And we've wrote, and, and again since that, we've wrote together um, a paper called Athletes Fit but, but, um, but Unhealthy, kind of with a question mark. And in that paper, it describes some of these, the fact that just what you're saying, Mark, where we, we assume that athletes, if you're, if you're fit, you therefore must be healthy. And that, that is the, you know, that's the dogma that's out there. That's what I used to believe. That's why I exercise. That's why I kind of got into it. I wanted to be fit and healthy. I liked, you know, I liked how it... Uh, it made my, my body look, um, you know, so real ego, ego driven stuff. But in actual fact, the what's under the hood of that, uh, uh, of that individual, that athlete could be far from, from being healthy. 
And, you know, we're only starting to get more and more evidence that that's, that's actually true. Um, and maybe I'll pass it over to the Plues there and he can, he can kind of talk through some of the things really that he found in one of his athletes that we've, um, that we blogged about and we can link the, the blog post to, um, to the, to the show notes here for sure. you, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a real good little intro from from the prof, and, and I think, um, but I think we should say from the start that we yeah we wrote we wrote a blog, and it, it, it got quite a lot of good of good interest, and it was in just one of the athletes that I um, that I co- that I've recently been coaching, who's a Swiss guy called um, Jan van Berkel, who's a, he's a you know, and he, he was more than happy to to present his results on our blog, and he's you know he's not he's not your average run of the mill. Um, athlete, he's a professional Ironman athlete, a guy who's close to eight hours for um, for Ironman. Um, he came fifth in the in the um, in the South African Ironman champs, which was actually a championship event. So he's 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 pretty handy. And when he first came on board with us, at least we gave him um, we made him do or he he wanted to do more a DEXA scan to have a look at his um, body fat levels and. What was the most interesting is when he had his pre, when he had his um, post testing. So after about um, after a good period of time on his um, on a lower carb lower carb diet and higher in fat, he was already quite lean in terms of subcutaneous fat. Um, you know, he was already twelve percent. And then over this period of time, what was remarkable was his visceral fat went down by forty eight percent. And so. So it, it, actually, it was really quite astounding that even in this guy who's already quite lean and is a professional Ironman athlete, um, that you can actually have these reductions in terms of visceral fat um, in someone who's actually lean and you assume is quite healthy. And as we know, like the um, visceral fat is an absolutely is absolutely huge indicator of just general overall health and longevity. We really want the fat around the organs to be as little as possible, but um, it just appeared that this wasn't the case in this fit fit athlete who was training all, all day, but clearly eating a diet that wasn't quite right for him. Yeah, I mean that's definitely something that we that I see a lot in clinic with kind of the higher performers on the endurance athlete side of things is when we start to run, you know, fasting insulins over fasting glucose and HA one Cs and CRPs, we're getting these levels that are you know, a lot higher than what we'd want to see and oftentimes in, almost in the pre diabetic range. So can you guys touch on the, the diet inflammation fat connection there a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so to me, this is a yeah, this is a it's a complex kind of area, um, and and again, we're just uh, I think we're just still touching the surface, getting more and more info on the whole thing. But there's you know there's generally this uh, I guess there's this vicious cycle that's kind of going on, you know, between um, you know excess body fat or, or yeah body fat visceral body fat mostly. Um, insulin resistance and chronic inflammation right so you got these three things that are kind of uh, spiraling around and um, yeah I guess if you're if you're feeding the body this uh, excess uh, glycemic um, diet um, it, it's kind of it's it's kind of helping to, to spiral these whole, uh, these processes out of control and they're all feeding back into one another and and they're kind of, kind of, it's a negative. Uh, well, it's not. A, it's a negative feedback system in the fact that it's it, they um, they spiral around and make things worse. Worse again, that inflammation, the the deposition of the body fat and the and the resistance uh, to to insulin. It's all quite complex. Uh, it's you know it's brain, uh, you know, uh, the brain, the neuro, the neuroendocrine systems are kind of confounding but i guess the long and the short of it is is um the, the only way to stop it is to make a concerted effort to to stop feeding the the body the um the things that are that are making it um uh you know spiraling that cycle and that tends to be the high glycemic uh sugar-based um or, and processed foods sort of system so I mean, as soon as you uh you stop that that process uh, and you get over that um, you, you you can block the the vicious cycle and uh, reduce inflammation, improve insulin resistance, and uh, and lower that 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 kind of that that visceral fat. And I, I guess I think I think that's probably what we found in uh, the Ian Van Berkel Ber- case study. 
And what was, I guess, fascinating in that was the fact that it was also associated with um, with that Im- that improved performance. Remarkable. Yeah, and I guess there's one thing that was, I guess, one thing that popped missed there was that what the that link between inflammation and fat deposition. So we know that things that are typically inf- inflamed um, fat will generally be stored around that area. So in the case of Yan, it was it was likely that his his um, organs were a little bit inf- were just generally more inflamed than the rest of his uh, the rest of him for for one reason or another. And, we, and like and I actually gave some possible explanations for why this might be in the um, in the blog and and, it, and looking at some research. It does suggest that when when you kind of when you are doing things to reduce any kinds of inflammation, and if it isn't a isn't a, an Ironman athlete, he would have, he would still have been doing a lot of low intensity exercise, which is getting rid of his blood glucose. It's lowering his blood glucose, so that will actually have an effect on reducing his um, inflammation. But it just wasn't enough to, to for it to subside around his organs at the same time, which is why subcutaneously he was actually quite lean. But in the visceral level, he wasn't that lean. He was still fat because he was he just wasn't doing enough to actually subside the inflammation around his organs. Which meant that the that's where was we were getting got some um, good storage of the fat, which is where the fatty deposition was really was really getting into. Yeah, I mean that's really interesting because you know even at Canada Basketball and working with our NBA players or various uh, you know with hockey players etc. This idea of you know performance and health, and as you get further down that road, you know the, the fork in the road where you know how much carbohydrate or even simple carbohydrate do we do we need to really perform at our best versus when does it start driving a lot more of these processes and I'm, I'm curious if you guys have found any you know associations with you know some of the nutrients involved in the antioxidant defense system whether it's the glutathione, the irons etc that uh, any parallels or deficiencies or imbalances that you guys have seen with your athletes there? Oh, uh, well, just speaking for myself, I definitely haven't gone that deep, Mark, in terms of uh, those sorts of uh, biochemical blood measures and stuff around. Uh, from my experience, they can be quite variable depending on when you're when you're getting that athlete. I, um, yeah, I'm not sure if the Blues is, has any experience in those sorts of those sorts of markers. Um, yeah, like unfortunately, we just we haven't we're not in that position where we can go that deep into getting those sorts of, of blood markers. Um, but yeah, I've heard, um, I know like um, Ale- one of our good friends, Alessandro Ferretti, he's, um, he was really influential in helping us write the blog and, um, and he's, a, he's a great guy and he's really insightful in this area. And I know that in some of my conversations with him, he's, um, he gets more into this area and he certainly finds some similar things to what you were suggesting there, Mark. Yeah, I know, we... I'd be interested in more, Mark, in, in your experience there. And um, yeah, it, so- it sounds like you're quite familiar with uh, with t- with taking these in your practice. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I suppose it's just getting this. Uh, you know, when we look at some of these blood labs in terms of telling a story, and of course, you guys with with everything going on with um, heart rate variability, which we'll talk about in a minute, and assessing you know training load and, and inflammation, we start to send to see these patterns of of. Uh, you know, imbalance or insufficiency or frank deficiency in some athletes. So I was just curious there if there's anything at the moment uh, in relation to that. But as you guys mentioned, it's not just the diet that's going to kick this uh, inflammation up in athletes, is it? I mean, training load is, is a massive one as well. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so much of it, like I was just going to say kind of uh, similar. It's um, every, you know, every athlete is an end of one. Every athlete is an in- individual. Um, some can... Some can tolerate this, the, these, uh, um, these poor, what we would probably call poor diets, and they, they just have a have a system that they seem can seem to be able to handle it. Others they, they can't. Others uh, have you know uh, massive uh, you know kind of stress stress and stuff in their life from various different angles, and this is where we're, we're finding, I guess. Um, it's helpful if we're monitoring something like heart rate variability that's getting an insight into the um, to, to the nervous system and how the nervous system is kind of coping with the various different stressors that are around an athlete's life. Yeah, and I think um, like, yeah, from the training perspective, one thing that you know that we I mean in my rowing in my days at rowing, obviously there was um, this, you know I really saw a difference when athletes were not. We're not doing that easy training easy enough, and that's um, and that really had a big plummet in um, in the HRV, and likely due to just that chronically increased inflammation. And often, when people 
I've, I've noticed in some athletes, when they do more and more high intensity training, they actually start to put on weight. And obviously, I mean, that can be twofold. Obviously, they're not doing the long, slow distance stuff, but maybe it could also be that they're just driving up inflammation because they're just chronically doing all, all the high intensity and really mobilizing all that blood glucose. And, um, and Prof actually just written a really good article for Training Peaks, and he, he shows that really nicely when he wore like a Dexcom, which, was a, which is a, um, a continuous blood glucose measure, and he showed the effects that doing one high-intensity interval training had on his, on his blood glucose, and it lasted for like, you know, that, that blood glucose was actually elevated for a really long period of time after. So that's why with, with the training that me and Prof actually give, we... And that's what we, if you look at our website, we're quite into, um, we say that we're different in that we don't just consider the performance, we're, we're health, performance, and longevity. So in our athletes, we really try and drive home to make sure that we're, we're pushing forward performance and health. Um, and that means that, you know, we ensure that the tr easy training is easy enough and the hard training is hard. And we kind of go off that polarized model. And that polarized model has not only been shown to improve performance, which has been, you know, the, which has shown time and time again that generally the best athletes use this sort of training, um, but also it's likely to actually improve health because you're you're actually not continuously stressing yourself from a central nervous system standpoint. And in one of my re re pieces of research that I published from a PhD in, in heart rate variability, we actually showed that chronic, like the real high intensity stuff is the stuff that really drives down the HRV. And obviously you don't want that HRV um, to be to be plummeting down. And when you guys, when you're talking about the high intensity training, uh, I recently had Martin Cabala on the on the show here. Is this more specific to like elite endurance athletes, where it's longer bouts of the high intensity versus kind of some of these really short bouts that a you know a weekend warrior, or, you know, desk worker might be doing? Well, I, I think it's um, I think that anything that's really driving your heart rate above that second ventilatory threshold is where it's um, you know is where it's at. I mean, any so what we've seen in some of our research is anything above kind of the aerobic threshold or lactate, the first the first threshold that you would see in a in a graded step test, whether that which is predominantly normally called your aerobic threshold, but it can also be called the first ventilatory threshold or the or um, LT, LT1, actually is the point of where we have some sympathetic mobilization. So that's the point of where we kind of, we are getting a bit more stress and that obviously gets higher and higher. The sympathetic stress is, gets, um, gets more and more as we increase exercise intensity, especially as we go over VT2. And lots of the, um, the high intensity interval training is actually above that anaerobic, what would be deemed or commonly known as anaerobic threshold or above VT2. So um, that's the kind of area that, that we're talking about. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, uh, Plus, can we actually circle back and maybe just give a quick definition for folks for heart rate variability and then let everyone know in terms of the, you know, the chronic cardio, what does that do to the, uh, to the heart rate variability? Yeah, I was, I was thinking we should have done that when I said, <laughs> when I was saying things, maybe I should explain this. Um, yeah, so um, heart rate variability is um, what it looks like. Is it looks at the gap between heartbeats. So even if we're all sat here right now and say a heart rate 60, it doesn't actually mean that the gap between each heartbeat is, is just one second. That gap between each heartbeat is actually varying all the time. So it might go from 1,000 milliseconds to 800 milliseconds to 400 milliseconds when we're at rest. Um, and the reason being is that it's actually linked to or our autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system is made up of two branches. You have your parasympathetic branch and your sympathetic branch. Um, the parasympathetic branch is hopefully as we're as we're sat here in the car, listening to this podcast, or just relaxed. We're a little bit more relaxed, so we're more parasympathetically dominant, and it's kind of known as your rest or digest system, which is kind of the where we repair and we we rebuild and we um, and we and we relax. Whereas conversely, on the other side, we've got the sympathetic system, which is your um, fight or flight, which is kind of more of a stress response. So, if we shift into more of a stress response. The, the variation between each heartbeat becomes less, so it actually starts beating more like a drum. So if we're exercising, for example, you'll notice that the heart, the beat of beating of the heart is actually very, um, very, very much in time, and it, there's not very much variation between heartbeats. But then as we relax, we get more variation between heartbeats. So what we can do is we can measure, we can measure this via heart rate variability, we get a direct, um, or we get a, a quick insight as to exactly what we do, what, what's going on in terms of autonomic nervous system and where we're balanced in terms of parasympathetic and sympathetic um, 
system or resting and stressed. Fantastic. And can you explain the difference between sort of rolling values versus just the isolated values? Yeah. So um, I guess like when it comes to monitoring, we, you like for you, you can tell your HRV every morning, and on that day you will get a a isolated value of what might be an indicator of, of high availability. Usually, what we what's measured in most apps and most um, what we recommended in some of my, our work is um, RMSSD. So that's the value on that given day at that specific time. And if anyone actually retakes their HRV. Um, like say a 30 second later it will actually be different because in reality our autonomic nervous system is always adapting and always slightly changing um, but then when we look at rolling values and average values we actually when we're doing it every day we're actually looking at how this changes over time um, and how the the average over a seven day period um, a rolling seven day period or even um, a week um, to just to see to get and, it, and to me it gives us more of a snapshot of what's actually Going on more, more um, in a in a chronic way rather than an acute way. Um, in the acute way, it's actually I find it without any kind of subjective markers of something um, or context of what's been going on in that person's life. It's quite hard to derive uh, meaning from meaning from the isolated day value. Whereas rolling average, you can get a little bit more from. Fantastic. Yeah, I was I was I was having the exact same conversation with an athlete this morning. And, uh, and, yeah, they were very concerned about a single isolated value of their, their heart rate variability. And, I, I, yeah, I kind of went to explain the same sort of thing where it's we're not, we're not concerned about just today. Get out there. Do, do your work. It's, um, it's, it's more about um, what's, what's the trend been looking like, um, you know, across from this week to the next, across, you know, this month to the next. So we're, yeah, we're looking at patterns more longitudinally as opposed to just today. So interesting, but don't, don't freak out about it. For sure. For sure. Great, yeah. great advice. And any, any favorite apps or um, reliable apps that you guys like to use? Yeah, we like, um, well, my personal preference one is, uh, is Marco Altini's, uh, heart rate variability for training. I just love, I just simply love the, um, the ease of uh, of how just how easy it is to take a, a you know a morning measure of your heart rate variability on your on your on your finger. Um, so you just you you put your finger over your camera in the morning. You wake up in the morning, put your finger over the camera, and it picks up through. Um, I basically uses the camera lens and the and the flash, and sends a little bit of a light beam through your through your finger. And it's it's amazing. It's you can actually even watch it picking up your uh, your heart rate and you, you measure it over a single minute uh, and you just do it at the same time of day every day and boom you've got your your marker of your heart rate variability it tells you if you've done a good reading or a bad reading and um, and then it's uh, you know there's it, it can link to training peaks now as well in terms of look, you know having a look at things with uh, with the training load it's got it's got all the plus is, um, you know, I guess markers of, of heart rate variabilities and rolling averages, and you know, it's it's basically operating, you know, all based on his various uh, methods. So, um, pretty pretty happy with that one. Um, awesome, and that should yeah. be done. Uh, if I've got two kids under four, I should be doing that before uh, the screaming, the crying, the, the the diaper changing, all that. Definitely. <laughs> good, yeah. good stuff. Definitely. Good stuff. Good luck with that. <laughs> But um, yeah, and also I just should add on that that like, we've actually just published um, recently published a paper as well that where we actually validated um, the PPG technology using using the HRV for training app, and we compared it to ECG and Polar Polar H7, and yeah, and it you know it was it was really encouraging um, that it was actually very pretty much one for one really with ECG. So yeah. It's, it's I mean the peop, it's it's the way the data is processed that makes it so um, so really very accurate. So yeah, it's just, and and I think with any type of monitoring, especially when it comes to athletes, it's all about um, the cost benefit. And back in you know when I first started doing my PhD, the cost of doing HRV was reasonably high. You know, you ha you know there was times where you'd have to do it for ten minutes and stand up, sit down, and w put on a heart rate strap, for which sure. is just like it's just hard to get athletes to do that. But now we're with HRVs moved along so well um, that we're now in the position where we can do it in one minute, just using your finger on the back of a phone. So it's 
Like, it's just so easy for everyone to do. And it's not just for athletes. It really is for, for anyone who's just interested in monitoring their everyday health and stress levels. Yeah, phenomenal. I mean, yeah, as, as you mentioned, even for clients uh, of mine who are just, you know, working downtown, long, busy days, I find it's a really easy, time-efficient way for them to get a handle on um, you know, that sort of nebulous thing called, quote-unquote, stress that for a lot of type A's just kind of push through and uh, and, and don't really acknowledge. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now, Prof, we mentioned as well, apart from diet, um, this idea of overstretched fat cells rather than increasing the number. Can you talk about how that contributes to this whole inflammatory piece? No, <laughs> Jeez, I, I, good, good one. I'm, I'm, I'm actually not too boned up on the overstretching of the, uh, of the, of the fat cells. Um, Do you want me to or, take it, Prof? You, you better, yeah, you better take it. Yeah, I guess it's. I mean, so we, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we mentioned this in a, we did mention this in the blog. So it was actually bought from out of this paper that was in the Molecular Cellular Biology um, Journal, and it was done by, I think it was a. It was either a Chinese or a Japanese group, and basically what they showed is that, especially around the in the in the visceral around the organs, like generally the fat cells they'll multi, you know they'll they will multiply, but um, when when we when we get fatter they'll go they'll go to a certain level and then they, they start multiplying. But around the visceral level, there seems to be a fact that they actually stretch, and this stretching. Um, this like hypertrophy of the the fats the the adipose sites actually increases inflammation. So the you imagine that you're if you're really chronically stretching something, it's just going to have an inflammatory response, and then you're you're again you're heightening the um, heightening inflammation, which then further increases the um, the fatty de deposition around around that area. So which is why in Yan we. You know, we may have seen that, which is why he was still having high levels of visceral fat despite having lower levels of um, subcutaneous fat. Absolutely, nice. yes. Nice. I would, I would just add on to that. It kind of comes back to what I was trying to explain before with respect to the fact that you've got this vicious cycle where you get uh, fat deposition and then the, the, ac the actual, um, I guess, that added stretching of more fat deposition cycles back to create more inflammation, which creates um, a more insulin resistance. And it's, again, this, this kind of this, this vicious, uh, vicious cycle um, that, uh, yeah, that creates, a, creates a real problem. I, I can even remember myself, um, you know, I guess, on a very high-carbohydrate diet and, and actually you know, looking in the mirror and seeing that added uh, visceral fat. I mean, it was definitely, you know, I was training, training hard, but on the, on the high carbohydrate, you know, high processed sugar diet. And, and I couldn't kind of get rid of my, my belly past, uh, you know, I guess maybe it was age 35 to 40. It just wasn't going away. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, I know myself, I was definitely overstretching some, overstretching some visceral fat cells for sure. All right. Well, if we talk solutions now here for a minute, now you guys mentioned DEXA scans in, uh, in your post there. Is like a DEXA scan or a bod pod a, a decent place for people to start to really get a sense of this or just having a body fat, you know, like a caliper test or something like that, would that be sufficient to give a, an idea um, if they are in that 15, 20 plus percent range? Yeah, the um, so the I, I have to on that one probably recommend the, the DEXA with respect to either bod pod, with the, the bod pod, it's kind of like a um, like an underwater wing. Um, if you've ever remember that one, Mark, I'm not sure if you when you were at UBC if you saw the yeah. um, the underwater weighing tank in uh, the Buchanan lab. Yeah, for so sure. So that's a that, that's very similar to that as as I understand it. I've actually never done a bod pod, but it's it's it uses that same sort of hydrostatic uh, density kind of um, principles as two compartment model, and uh, it comes with some error. So you're not going to be able to be actually get at how much visceral fat is in you there. Same with skin folds. I mean, although you could get, you know, you could see what's happening around, uh, you know, your abdominal skin fold sites to get an insight into there. But again, um, not going to be as sensitive as as this DEXA, te DEXA technology, dual X-ray absor absorptometry, where it's actually um, looking at the minerals that are. Um, well, I think it's basically a three compartment model. So you're actually getting um, a marker of bone, a marker of fat-free mass, 
and a marker of fat mass. And, and specifically, you can pinpoint certain areas as, they, as we did with, with, uh, with the Anven Burkel. And uh, you can actually, actually look at how much fat is actually being removed from, from the visceral area, from the organs. Whereas I don't think you could do that with any of the other, other technologies, to my knowledge. For sure. Know, yeah, if it's visceral fat that you're interested in, then um, like the depths is the, the, really the best way to go for it. For sure, and with and with Jan, you know, it's quite cool is that we did like that. But you can look at the bone density at the same time, and that obviously gives you quite a good marker of um, a reasonably good marker of accuracy from test to retest. And you really, if the if the tests are reasonably close to one another and it's a normal person with no disease, then you'd expect those to be quite close. So it gives you a good idea of how accurate these tests is. And with Jan, they were pretty much spot on each time from test to retest, but his visceral fat was massively different. So it gave us good confidence in the, in the data. That, that's phenomenal. Now for, you know, docs or strength coaches, trainers listening in who perhaps have clients or athletes in a similar situation, uh, what would they be doing on the dietary side of things? What are some of the approaches that you guys took in terms of modulating carbohydrate intake, et cetera, to kind of get Jan back uh, performing his best? Yeah, well, I guess um, I, I'll talk on I'll talk on behalf of, of what we did with Jan and like the good thing about these guys who are typically you know really good endurance athletes is that if you tell them to do something, they'll they'll, they'll there'll be no questions and they'll do it immediately immediately with with little with little resistance. Um, so basically, what we did with Jan is we just reduced his his carbohydrate intake and increased his fat, uh, moderate moderate protein, and um, quite a lot of riding on. I'm um, kind of well, not not fasted, but making sure that especially his aerobic rides where he'd be doing or long runs where he's not really got any intensity, he wouldn't really eat before. He'd just have something that's um, a bulletproof coffee or something that really maintains his insulin very low. Um, and and yeah, looking at really, I mean, he wasn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say he was always ketogenic um, to use that word, but um, he was. You know, his his. Carbohydrate intake would be around 100 grams to, per day, um, which is, you know, and, and with these guys who are training so much, it's actually really hard to, I personally, I found that to keep carbohydrate in that kind of what would be classed as a ketogenic state, you know, like around that 50 grams is actually really hard because they just purely have to eat so much food. For sure. Uh, For you know, sure. if you're training 30 hours, 35 hours a week, if there's, there's carbohydrate in nearly you know, there's li there's small amounts of carbohydrate in nearly everything because of these guys are having to get so many calories in it's unless they're just eating pure butter or something like that, it's <laughs> it's actually really hard to do. So so that's where Yan was and we would measure his um we'd measure his ketones or his his um acetate um acetone by by using ref ketones, which is on the Keto ketonics um, ketonics device. Yep. Um, so he was he, and these were showing that he was in he was in some sign of ketosis um, during during this period on on and off. So yeah, yeah, and I I mean I in terms of just general guidelines, um, I mean there's so many that's out there. I think you've you've probably even got something. Uh, that's similar to what uh, I'd recommend, Mark. I was just kind of glancing on your website. Um, I, I like um, Tim Noakes' Real Meal Revolution for just uh, good general pr principles. I like uh, Grant Schofield's What the Fat Book. Um, so yeah, you know, real, um, you know, good healthy fats. Uh, you know, lots of lots of color, green leafy vegetables, uh, cruciferous vegetables, and uh, yeah, pretty pretty stock standard sort of healthy diet stuff in, in my opinion. So Yeah. Yeah, I find it's amazing that sort of middle group of weekend warriors that we have, you know, here downtown Toronto who maybe have transitioned over from running to cycling and you get guys who are 15, 20, 25, 30 pounds overweight who are logging, you know, hundreds of kilometers a week on their bikes and trying to perform their best but sort of following the the old style um, or the classic, I should say, of just carbohydrate loading and carbohydrates during training. And it's amazing how, you know, between the inflammation and the insulin dysfunction, the high blood sugars, I mean, um, you know, these guys are really struggling on that metabolic flexibility side. So um, I find that to be a, a, a big win. But if we circle back to the performance side, um, I know classically, obviously, in uh, elite performance, this idea of carbohydrates are king. You know, where do you guys strike that balance in terms of on, on game day or race day? Um, is it is a similar protocol for, for Yan or are there periods where you're going to be increasing that amount um, during exercise? 
Um, yeah, so with Jan, um, I'll, I'll talk. I'll just I'll talk with Jan first. Is that yeah we like that? That was a question after I wrote this blog. Like uh, this question that I got so much was, oh, what, well, what is he eating during the race? You know, and then people are expecting me to say, oh, he's eating uh, avocados and nuts, but that's not the case. Like it's um, it is a training. It's a tr- it's a training tool and. And I always think that the idea is that on race day, you get to treat your body like a rental car and he just, he just powers it as much as he, as much as he wants. Um, well, not as much as he wants, but he got, he'll actually take around 55 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour. And that'll be in the form of gels and sports drink and, and whatnot. So, but the, the important thing is that we shift, he's, he's, he's still shifted to be using more fat. At the same exercise intensity as he was before so he's actually his need to take in as much carbohydrate is a lot less but he still needs a little bit i mean even with me for example um so if i do a graded exercise test i know that at 300 watts so my ironman power will be around 260 watts so at 300 watts is where i cross over from being more carbohydrate to more fat um so, so from more fat to more car- carbohydrate dependent so at my ironman intensity i'm still for sure I'm still having a little bit of, I'm still dipping into some carbohydrate, but it's still a huge amount less than most people. Um, so I still need some, but I don't need to be cramming in 90 grams per hour, which means that I'm in such a, so much of a better space for when it comes onto the run on the rest of the race where I don't have any gastrointestinal discomfort and um, I'm just, just, just a lot better. For, so from a performance standpoint, yes, um, carbohydrate during the race. And we actually just increase it just a fraction in the three to day, three to four days um, before the race, like to around 150, 150 grams per day. Um, but we don't forget with these guys, when you, if you're quite metabolically flexible and you're quite fat adapted, if you're taking in those, if you're taking in those carbohydrates, you you actually just store them in, into the muscle and you keep burning fat. So someone who's not that who's not that fat adapted, they'll they need to take more carb in generally because they'll just keep they'll take it in and burn it immediately. Whereas someone who's more metabolically flexible and is more fat adapted, they'll just they'll store it. So they actually don't need to really increase it by that much, but a little bit of an increase is always a, always a good thing. And I suppose if you t- take into account all the reduction in carbohydrates for all those training phases for these, you know, whether they're elite or recreational exercise, I mean, it's just a tremendous amount of sugar and simple carbohydrate that's been removed as well, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Which is just, you know, and that makes them, makes them. I think it makes them recover better. It makes them adapt better. Makes them feel better. Um, so yeah, and then and and that's another question that I often get is, well, oh well, how does you know how does they? Um, they don't have a really sore stomach if suddenly that um, if suddenly you don't have any carbohydrate and you, on one day you cram it right in and and I have yet to see that happen to anyone to be honest with you um I think you know carbohydrates are macronutrient and your your body kind of knows what to do with it it's not there's nothing new um, and I I know that with Jan he's that was his question he was worried that on the day he'd not have any carbohydrate during training for you know for quite a long period of time and he was worried that he was going to get a sore stomach and not be able to take it but when you when you have the ability to reduce it to a really safe amount which is around like 55 60 grams per hour then then you're actually absolutely absolutely fine and I know from my own experience as well doing Ironman I never have any kind of gastrointestinal discomfort when I'm when I'm racing because um, even though I don't really have any carbs during um, during training. Yeah, I was always amazed yeah. too with working with. Uh, oh, sorry, I let you jump in there, bro. Well, I was I was just gonna say it's. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the flu's covered most of that really really well. I would just maybe emphasize the uh, the fact that um, one of the biggest debilitators, um, out there, uh, for triathletes that uh, long distance athletes that, um, that I come across is this, um, gastrointestinal complaints from overconsumption. Well, uh, I'm, I'm hypothesizing it's from overconsumption of too many carbohydrates, uh, relative to what their gut is, is used to. Um, yeah, there's some, you know, there's some people suggesting that you need to need to train that, but, um, yeah, I mean, to, to me, it makes more logical sense to go the other way, upreg, you know, um, upregulate your fat oxidation, become less reliant on on carbohydrate during prolonged uh, prolonged ex- exercise and 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 such. And yeah, I guess uh, it, the I think that was yeah, that's probably that's probably what I, what I wanted to say. Yeah, but, and just just finishing on that, I do think that. 
you know, a lot of this idea that you hear that you have to train your race nutrition and you have to train, eat what, you, eat what you're going to race with in training. I just think that's really sports nutrition and industry trying to make, trying to sell more of their product. You know, like for if sure. people only use their product for racing, they wouldn't be selling that much. But if people are practicing during all the training, imagine how much more they're going to be selling. So I think that's quite, it's pushed a lot by sports, um, like the propaganda of sports nutrition. I, I totally agree. I mean, it, definitely with the GI complaints. I mean, I, I see that a lot in parallel with the, uh, you know, elite Ironman and endurance athletes every three or four hours. I mean, if they don't eat, you, you really don't want to hang around them very closely at work or wherever else. I mean, talk about hangry. And so you get these collection of symptoms that go on. And all of a sudden, as you mentioned, if you start improving that metabolic flexibility, you reduce carbohydrate, um, these folks can go a hell, heck of a lot longer without, uh, you know, having these kind of crashes and all those GI symptoms that just plague them, I mean, uh, start to really dissipate. So that's uh, good to hear that you guys are seeing similar things as well. Now, if we shift yeah. gears a little bit here, uh, getting onto more of the personal side, I know you're both busy guys. Can you tell us a little bit about your morning routines? Are you coffee drinkers? How do you uh, get all that stuff done in the day? <laughs> well, I, I am a coffee drinker. I do, do love my coffee in the morning. Um, yeah, kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, right, right now I'm just, yeah, uh, coffee with cream and, uh, but that's, that's probably, that's usually it until like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's one o'clock here in, um, in uh, British Columbia time right now. And yeah, that's, that's all I've had. Um, that, that, that kind of holds me till, till, till now. And, you know, I've, I've had a, had a good run as well in the morning. Um, so I mean, I'm kind of, a I kind of I tend to fast until the late afternoon, and then I'll, uh, you know, I'm kind of eating, you know, one or two meals a meals a day, and and I'm just, you know, I'm comfortable comfortable doing that. So yeah, it just I, I'm also also really big into the sleep as well. I think in terms of, you know, morning routines, I I, I used to get up, you know, crack a dawn, even you know, four o'clock kind of thing to to get it all done, but. Um, yeah, there's you know there's more and more research is coming into the importance of sleep, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to you know, you know make sure that I get uh, um, adequate sleep, um, you know when, whenever I can. So not not afraid to have a little bit more of a sleep in these days. Uh, um, you know, the, yeah, yeah, that's, that's about it. Yeah, I guess and yeah. I, I I have my, my first drink of the day is usually a tea, but you know I am English, so I usually have actually a tea first thing in the morning. Good cup of tea, and then but my my mornings actually vary because I'm I'm quite often in the pool at five thirty, so I'll get up and uh, have a quick tea. I'll get up at like five and have a quick cup of tea, and then I'll be I'll be driving to the pool, and then I'll swim from five thirty till seven. Yeah, and then I'll then I'll, then that's kind of I guess that's when my morning begins. I'll come back and I'll then have a coffee. I'll take my wife; she's usually still in bed, so I'll take her a, a drink, a, a tea in bed, and then um, yeah, start the day from there. And I'll usually add a bit of MCT powder to my coffee in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, it keeps me, which keeps me going. Um, and, it, and it and it really like what my amount of eating is a hundred percent dependent on how much I'm training, really. Um, so like if if I'm not training, I'll I'll often if I'm not training a lot, I'll do I won't really eat as much in the morning, and I'll be a bit like Prof, and I'll do the some kind of intermittent fasting. Um, but when I at the moment I'm training for I'm doing half Ironman Cairns in a couple of weeks, so I'm I'm training a reasonable amount. So I'll I'll try and keep my you know my my intake of food a little bit more regular. Still obviously low carbohydrate, but. Um, just trying to keep up the um, energy balance because I don't really, I don't think it's a good thing if you're training hard to actually be negative energy balance all the time. So um, yeah, I'll just yeah. try and try and keep up with that for sure. And I, and I should, I just sh should say as well, like I'm not feeling like so. I haven't haven't really eaten with the exception of the coffee that I had this morning. I, I feel perfectly fine, and I think it's a real powerful thing just in a to kind of not 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 to have to eat if you don't if you don't want to. Um, so yeah, I mean. I'm 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 bubbling my uh, a few words here and there and stuff throughout the podcast, but generally speaking, <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I've got it mostly together. And I don't feel hungry or anything like that. So it's uh, it's 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 kind of a neat thing. And I, I you know I, I compare that to how things used to be before I you know I guess w became fat adapted and and uh, yeah you you know it was like every every two three hours you you gotta you gotta make sure you're eating and um, yeah it's real nice to be freed of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Please, yeah, a quick, quick, quick question for you. Thing, from, the first thing I do actually in the morning, every morning, is I, I take my blood glucose and then my um, HRV. 
every morning and add them together and have a look at what's going on. <laughs> That's what I do. That's my first thing I do in the morning, obviously. Uh, yeah. uh, and same with me with the exception of the blood glucose. Although I do have one of these uh, continuous blood glucose monitors that I'm going to be putting, sticking back into me pretty soon again to, for, for some more experimentations. Uh, yeah, I do, uh, do love tracking the continuous blood glucose monitoring stuff with, uh, it's, it's proxy being insulin. So it's, a uh, it's fascinating experience or, uh, yeah, just, um, a fascinating experience and, and learning you can get from these, these devices. And I, and I think we're going to see more and more of those, um, kind of coming up here. Um, and, and, and those being used for your, for your own N1 experimentation in terms of what you need, uh, what you need to eat personally, and uh, yeah, how it, how things fluctuate with stress, lack of sleep, uh, exercise, etc. Phenomenal, guys. Well, uh, well said. Thank you so much, Plus and Prof, for taking the time out today. Uh, where can folks get in t- touch with you or keep up with all your great work? Um, well, we can have a look at um, we got you can take a look at our website, which is um, pluesandprof dot com. Um, we've also got a Facebook page. And we're also quite active on Twitter. Um, we've got the Plus and Prof Twitter account and our own personal account. My personal account is at the Plus one And Prof, yours is Paul B. Lawson. Paul B. Larson. Yeah. That's the we'll, one. We'll, we'll see you out there, everyone. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, 